Section 36 is on something that we call definite integrals. So a definite integral, by definition, uh, is basically kind of what we learned last time, where it involves an infinite sum. But no worries, we're not going to do the infinite sums anymore. So um, you'll often see this elongated S, and it has something to do with the antiderivative. Um, but that's our shortcut notation. So previously, I told you don't like try to memorize the, the previous sigma notation, because uh, it's a little bit complicated. Um, but just know that it's all of the heights of the rectangles times the widths. Um, this is the notation that you will need to know. So you have a little elongated S, which is called an integration sign. Um, and the A and the B are the integral, or the interval that you're integrating on. Um, so we say that F is integrable on A to B. All right, so there are lots of different rules. We've talked about right-hand endpoints, left-hand endpoints. Um, we're also going to talk about something called the midpoint rule um, in this section. So if we had, you know, any interval, we can choose what we call right-hand endpoints and go this way, or we can choose left-hand endpoints and go this way, or we could actually choose on the very center of the inter in interval as well. So if I had some kind of curve and I had my partition like this, then the height of the rectangle would be right there in the middle. Um, so we'll talk about that one today as well. All right, so anyway, so it says for f of x equals sine of x on 0 to 2 pi, give an area inter interpretation of, you know, our sigma notation. So the limit as n goes to infinity, um, the summation from i equals 1 to n of f of c i times delta x. Okay, so basically it's saying if you're finding the area for sine of x on the interval 0 to 2 pi, what you would do is you would take these little tiny rectangles, and let's say we, we did like left-hand endpoints, you know, so we would have something like this. Um, I'd obviously have more of them. I'm not filling in all of them. Um, so if I had all of those different rectangles with left-hand endpoints, and then I had all of these rectangles with left-hand endpoints, well, when I talk about the heights, the f of whatever, the heights for these ones are positive, For all of the rectangles, but the heights of these rectangles are negative. So if I'm taking like a, a positive number times our width of our interval, remember that's the width, and this is what I said, the height of the rectangle, um, and I take the positive number times the width, and I add all those together, and then I take all the negative numbers times the width, and I add all those together, and then I take the sum of all of them, the area is actually equal to zero. Okay, so it's, it's kind of confusing in calculus because we'll be talking a lot about area and um, integrals and so on. It's not, it's not technically the area. If we were talking about the area in calculus, we would find this positive amount and this positive amount, and we would add them together. Um, but that is definitely what the meaning of this is. All of that is equal to zero. Okay, so it's, it's a little bit strange um, that you can have positive heights for rectangles and negative heights. All right, so this one says use the midpoint rule with n equals 5 to approximate this integral. All right, so it's basically saying the same thing. It's just not using like that sigma notation that's very confusing. What it's saying is we have some kind of function, 1 over x, and our, our um, interval is from 1 to 2. Okay, these are called the limits of integration, the 1 and 2. Okay. So if I kind of sketch that out, if I have my function is 1 over x, and I'm going from 1 to 2, what I'm asking is to try to find all of these rectangles between 1 and 2, um, where I'm adding up all of those areas of those rectangles. Okay, that's what it's asking for. When it says n equals 5, it's telling us that we have 5 rectangles. Okay, so we're not doing the infinite number anymore, um, much to your uh, <laughs> excitement, I'm sure. All right, so if we have five rectangles, what I'll often do is I'll kind of draw out a nice long in, um, interval off to the side. And I want to divide it into five pieces. Well, I have a total distance from one to two of one, right? And so if I divide it in five pieces, I'm going to have one fifth for the width of each interval. Um, so I'm going to have uh, one and one fifth, so 1.2. 1.4, 1.6, and 1.8. So what this means is I've divided into uh, five strips like that. Okay, but what the midpoint rule means is that 
for looking at the height, not using the right side or the left side, not using 1 or 1.2, but actually using the value directly between them. So a lot of times I'll draw like little stars there. So I know, oh, I'm not going to use those numbers that I actually found um, for the sides of my rectangles. I'm actually going to use 1.1, 1.3, 1.5, 1.7, and 1.9. I'm going to use the numbers that are in between. Okay, so basically it's kind of hard to draw, but right here in the center, that's going to be the height. Right here in the center, that's the height. Okay, and it's kind of hard to see, but if I kind of exaggerate it, when you have right in the center of a partition, a lot of times a little bit will be above and a little bit will be below. So you'll have this kind of rectangle where, you know, you're cutting off part of it, like this is gone, but you're gaining an extra piece. So it's a pretty precise um, way of estimating. Okay, so I need to find f of 1.1, f of 1.3, I need to find all of those heights because that's going to be the heights of each of these rectangles. Okay, so the easiest way to do that, and I went ahead and found these numbers for you to kind of speed it up, is to use the table function on your calculator. So if you plug in y equals 1 over x into your y1 and then do second table, you can plug in 1.1, 1.3, 1.5, 1.7, and 1.9 pretty quickly and get those values. Okay? So you could do that and get all those values, um, or you could just put it directly into your calculator as well. So if I'm doing a midpoint rule with 5, I, I notate it as M5, and I'm going to have the width of each rectangle. So the width from here to here is going to be 0.2. So I'm going to have 0.2, and then I'm going to have times whatever f of 1.1 is. So that was whatever 1 over 1.1 was. So then I'm going to have 0.2, 1 over 1.3. 0.2, 1 over 1.5. Width is 0.2, 1 over 1.7, and 0.2 times 1 over 1.9. I guess I didn't, I didn't actually find these values on my table already. Um, you can do it if you want. But just make sure you use like five decimal places if you do that. So I think I went ahead and put this into my calculator. I did 0.2 and then I did all of the, you know, I found the 1 over 1.1, 1, 1 over 1.3, etc. So I had 0.2 times, I think it was like 3.4595. So that gave me an answer for my midpoint rule with five rectangles of 0.692. Okay, so that's my answer for that one. All right, so it's kind of nice. It's not, it's not an infinite number of rectangles. It's just telling you like five rectangles, four rectangles, whatever. So it's a lot easier to find. All right, so the next one. So it says use the midpoint rule to approximate the area under the curve 8 over um, x squared plus 1 and above the x-axis on the interval 2 to 6. So we're going from 2 to 6 now. And again, we're using what's called the midpoint rule. So we're using four rectangles, so we want m sub 4, meaning the midpoint rule with four rectangles. And so with our picture, it's actually already very nice for us because we have our partitions that give us those four um, equally spaced rectangles, okay? And the midpoint rule means that we're going to take that height and we're going to go straight over. The height, straight over. The height, straight over. And the height, straight over, okay? So if you don't have a sketch already, that's when I would draw the number line. So kind of get used to drawing this number line and thinking, okay, I have a distance of four, so that means my width is going to be one, right, if I divide into four pieces. Oops, didn't space that very well. So I'm going to have three, four, and five. And then I want the midpoint rule, so I actually want these numbers that are directly in between. Okay, that's why I, I use that right there. That's using uh, 2.5 and plugging it into the function. So I'm going to use 2.5, 3.5, 4.5, and 5.5 as my x values for the midpoint rule. Okay, but I still need to find the height. So the height is actually plugging in to the function. Okay, so we're plugging in here. Okay, and you can do that all in your calculator all at once. It doesn't matter. The width, as you can see, is just going to be 1. Okay, so our width is 1. All right, and our heights are whatever the f of, you know, c off is, we often call it. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to have 1 as my width, and then I'm going to multiply by f of 
and then I have 1, and I'm going to multiply by f of 3.5. 1 times f of 4.5, and 1 times f of 5.5. Okay, so I'm going to find all of that. So the ones, I mean, you can see that they don't matter. So what I'm really finding on my calculator is um, 8 over 2.5 squared plus 1, 8 over 3.5 squared plus 1, 8 over 4.5 squared plus 1, and 8 over 5.5 squared plus 1. So again, you could use that table function if you want to, um, but this will be one that has a lot of decimals, so you'll probably want to carry over like five decimals so that you can round to three decimals at the end. Okay, so I went ahead and I found this, and I had like 2.33969 something. So if I'm rounding to three decimals, I'll say 2.340 is my answer. Okay, so that was the midpoint rule with four rectangles. So if you wanted, you know, eight rectangles, well then your width then would be 0.5, and you would make your intervals even smaller. Um, okay, so the definite integral, the definite integral, like I said, has something to do with antiderivatives, which we're going to talk about next time. Um, but a definite integral, uh, in order to use this, you need for, in order you need a in order to use it for the area of a region, I guess I should say, you need for f to be continuous and non-negative. Okay, so we, I gave that sine example, uh, y equals sine of x at the beginning, and it went above and then it also went below. We don't want things that go below. We want non-negative. We want it to be above the axis. Okay, on the closed interval a to b. So if I want the area from a to b, all it ends up being is that little fancy integration sign, the elongated s, from a to b of whatever the function is. Okay, so basically we end up taking the antiderivative and using that somehow to find the answer. All right, so for this example, we're going to go ahead and do a Riemann sum again. Um, but now we're going to take right endpoints. n is equal to 6, so that means we have 6 rectangles. Okay, and we're going to go on the interval 0 to 3. That's the a and the b. Okay. So let's kind of sketch out what we have. So if I have f of x equals 4x minus x squared, um, you can quickly find the zeros of that function by pulling out an x. So you can see that x is um, equal to 0 and x is equal to 4. That's where it's crossing the x-axis. Okay. And it's a downwards parabola, so it looks something like this. All right, so we want to find the area on the interval 0 to 3. So not the entire. It doesn't go all the way back down to 4. We're stopping right here at 3. So we want to find that area. So it's kind of a weird shape. Okay, it's not like a semicircle. We don't know what shape it is. Okay, so that's why we have to use calculus. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to use right endpoints. So that's when I kind of want to see that number line again. I'm going from 0 to 3. And I want to have six rectangles. So if I have a distance of three and I want six rectangles to fit in there, you guys see like you're going to have a, each interval is going to be like 0.5. So we're going to divide. Okay. So when I do that, I'm going to have 0.5, 1, 1.5, 2, and 2.5 as my endpoints. Okay, and it's kind of hard to, to draw on here, but we're using right endpoints. For, so we're going to go over, 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 over. Did I get six in there? I think I only did five. All right, but that's basically what we're doing. Okay. So a lot of times on the number line, what I'll do is I'll draw like this. So I know that I'm starting on the right and I'm going to the left. So basically I'm going to use all of those numbers except for zero. I don't use that one, okay, because it's not a right endpoint. It would end up being something that we use for a left endpoint. Okay, whoops. Let me go ahead and put that back. All right. So what I'm going to need to find is f of 3, f of 2.5, f of 2, 1.5, 1, and 1.5. Okay, those are the endpoints I'm using. So that's where it would be good to use a table. So I want to use 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, 2, 2.5, and 3. And I went ahead and I already found those numbers. Okay. So when I found those numbers, I got 1.75, 3, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 
3.75, 4, 3.75, and 3. So not bad. Okay. And the width, right, the distance of each rectangle, this width, is clearly 0.5. So when I do the height of the rectangle times the width of the rectangle, I'm going to have 0.5 times whatever f of 0.5 was, plus 0.5 times whatever f of 1 is, plus 0.5 times whatever f of 1.5 is. And I'm going to continue that until I get to uh, 3. Okay? So this is going to be my uh, right endpoints with 6 rectangles. So I notate it as r sub 6. Sometimes you'll see RRAM. That means right rectangular area method. Okay, so you might see that as well. All right, so, and I found those, so I have 0.5 times 1.75 plus 0.5 times 3 plus 0.5 times 3.75 and so on until I get to 3. So this answer ends up being 9.625 is the answer. Okay, but this is just an approximation method. We have found an approximation using six rectangles. And we've talked before about how it would really be best if we could use, you know, more rectangles, like 100 or an infinite amount. So if we were going to use an infinite amount, what it's actually going to be equivalent to is this weird notation, the elongated S from 0 to 3, right? That was the interval we were on, 0 to 3. These are our limits of integration of whatever our function is. So the function that we're underneath is going to be the 4x minus x squared. Okay. Oh, I haven't mentioned the dx. The dx always goes, like this integration sign and the dx always go together. So don't be surprised by that. They always, they always go together. We could actually use any variable. If I use like a dj, I could have 4j minus j squared dj. This is just weird, okay? But usually you'll have an x. A dx. All right. So number two. So it says evaluate the Riemann sum uh, for f of x equals 9 minus x squared, taking the sample points to be midpoints. Okay. n equals 4, so that's four rectangles. And then a is equal to 1 and b is equal to 3, so we're on the interval 1 to 3. Okay. So let's sketch it out. So I have 9 minus x squared. I know what that looks like. That's a parabola. It's upside down. Its height is 9. And we're going to go between 1 and 3. And 3 is actually where it's crossing the x-axis. You can plug in 3, you'll see it's 0. So we're finding the area right here. Okay. So if I do that, again, I'm using a midpoint. Sometimes it's nice to draw the number line, 1 to 3. I want four rectangles. So I'm going to divide it in half and then half again. So I can find those numbers. It's 2, and then 1.5, and then uh, 2.5. Okay, and these create what we call the partitions. So if I was going straight up, you know, it's creating my, um, my partitions like that. Okay, but it's not telling me the heights. Okay, the heights actually occur using the x value in between these. Okay, so that's why... Remember, we're using the midpoint formula, so we need to go directly between there. So if I was finding those numbers, those numbers are going to be 1.25, let's see, 1.75, 2.25, and 2.75, okay? So my midpoint formula with four rectangles then, the width, as you can see, is 0.5 for the each rectangle. And the height for the first one is going to be whatever f of 1.25 is. Okay, so I'm going to have 0.5 times f of 1.25. And I'm going to have 0.5 times f of 1.75. I'm going to have 0.5 times f of 2.25. And I'm going to have 0.5 times f of 2.75. So when you have the width in common, you can always pull the width to the front. And I find each of those things. So I went ahead and found them. So I have 7.4375 for the first one. 
Then I have 5.9375, 3.9375, and the last one is 1.4375. Okay, and those are all exact values. I didn't round at all. So when I find those numbers, I have 0.5 times, it ends up being like 18.75. So when I multiply by 0.5, I get 9.375. Okay, and that's my answer. So again, if you wanted the true area, that's just the integration formula, okay? So our interval was 1 to 3, and the function that we're underneath is 9 minus x squared. Okay, so that's the true area. And if you actually find that one, um, oops, I haven't found it yet. Let me find it. The last one, the true area, was actually uh, 9. So we were pretty close with 9.625. But I haven't found this one. So let me go ahead and find this one really quickly. It's very simple. Um, and like I said, you'll look in the next section. And then it's 9 and 1 third. Okay, so we're pretty close because uh, we had 9.375. So it's 9.3 repeating is the answer, the actual answer. All right, so kind of going back to where we were last time. On the AP test, these are the types of questions that you have on the multiple choice that deal with um, infinite sums, or this one's not really an infinite sum, this is uh, the sum of 25 rectangles or something. So let's talk about how to understand what this means. Okay, so you could, I mean, you could spend a lot of time on the AP test trying to figure out what all of these numbers are, simplifying, figuring out the answer. There's no point to doing that. Okay, it's wanting us to write it as a definite integral. It wants us to write it in that setup where we have some kind of function, we have an uh, interval that it's on, right, and we have the elongated s and the dx that go together. Okay, so let's think about it. If you look for a pattern, you'll quickly see that you have 1 over 25 in common for all of them. Okay, well, we had something in common for all of them in those last examples. The thing that was in common was the 0.5 on that last example, right? That was the width, okay? So we can tell that the width of each rectangle is 1 over 25, okay? Now, the thing that's a little bit harder is figuring out what the function is. So if you look back here, you know, we had things like f of 0.5, f of 1, f of 1.5. Okay, let's see how that's related. To this one. Okay, so our function is something kind of from these. Okay, so if you can tell, you're going to have a 1 minus something squared. Okay, so let's let that be our function. 1 minus, and I'm going to call it x squared. Okay, and let's talk about it. Is it really x? Is it something else? What's going on here? Okay, each of these numbers was 1 over 25 minus 1, 2 over 25 minus 1. They all have that minus 1 in common. So what I'm going to think about it as is negative 1 plus 1 over 25, and then negative 1 plus 2 over 25, and negative 1 plus 3 over 25. And what that creates is a little interval. It's saying I have negative 1, but when I do that first width, that first width was 1 over 25, that's the new right endpoint. It's negative 1 plus 1 over 25. Okay, and then when I do the second width, which is also 1 over 25, that's that next right endpoint, negative 1 plus 2 of the 1 over 25s, right? Does that make sense? And in order to fill this, I'm going to look all the way at the end. I want to see how many bumps I have. How many of those 1 over 25s do I have? I have 25 of them, okay? I have 25 rectangles. Okay, so that means that if I have 25 of the 1 over 25, this endpoint right here is going to be 0. Does that make sense? Because you're going to fill it with 25 over 25. You're going to fill it with 1. Um, so negative 1 plus 1 gives you 0. All right, that's what we want. Okay, that's giving us our oops, limits of integration. We start at negative 1 and we go to 0. It's always like the smallest number to biggest number on top. And then our function is 1 minus x squared. And then we always put that dx at the end. Okay, that's exactly what we want. Okay, so it seems a little bit strange, but it's using some information that we've used before. 
All right, so same thing on the next one. So the thing that's in common, right, if I went ahead and multiplied it in, is right there. That's our width. Our width is 1 over 50. Okay, and if I think about an interval, I know that I'm adding a 1 over 50, and then I have two of the 1 over 50s. Right, that's that right end point, and then I have three of the 1 over, 50, 1 over 50, so 3 over 50, and so on. And I go all the way to 50 over 50. Well, that means I have 1 here. But what was the starting point? The starting point was 0. Okay, so this interval is 0 to 1. And the function, right, can you guys see? The function has to do with the square root. It's just the square root of x. It's saying plug in the first right end point, 1 over 50. Plug in the second right end point, 2 over 50. Plug in the next right end point, 3 over 50. And so on. So that is what we're looking for. Okay, and I know those are tricky. There's not a ton of them on the AP test, um, so don't worry too much about it. But, yeah, I mean, they do pop up on the multiple choice. They'll probably be, like, two or I would say two, not even three. All right. So continuing on with our talk with definite integrals, some of these we can actually find just by finding the area. Sometimes we have triangles, sometimes we have rectangles, semicircles, and so on. So sometimes we can actually find the area without even doing an antiderivative. Okay, so we haven't really talked about how to do the antiderivative to find the area. These ones are ones where we can just sketch. Okay, so what we are saying here is that our function is y equals 6. Right, which is a horizontal line. So here's y equals 6. And then our interval is from 3 to 7. Those are our limits of integration. So if we start from 3 and we go to 7, well, the area underneath y equals 6 trapped between 3 and 7, we can find that. It's just a rectangle. That's all we're doing. So our area then is going to be, you know, 4 units times 6, so we end up getting 24 for our area. Very easy. Okay, the next one's a little bit harder to sketch. We have f of x equals x plus 4, or y equals 1x plus 4, y equals mx plus b, right? So we go up 1, right 1, up 1, right 1, up 1, right 1. Oops, totally missed it. <laughs> get that. And I'm going on the interval 0 to 3. Okay. So some of you, if you're finding the area, you might do a triangle and a square. You could do that and find the area of each one and add it together. Or you could even actually do the area of a trapezoid. We have a trapezoid here. It's just kind of on its side. It's not the way that we normally think about trapezoids. So, you know, normally we think about a trapezoid like that, and the formula is 1 half h times v1 plus v2. And we're going to talk about trapezoids a lot in the very last section for J-term. Um, so let's go ahead and use trapezoids. Okay, so this distance right here is going to be 3. No, wait, 4, actually. The y-intercept was 4, right? And this distance here is 3. And if I plug in 3 to find this point, this point is 3 comma 7, right? If I plug in 3 to the function, 3 plus 4 is 7. Okay, so looking at the trapezoid on its side, we have a, a height of 3, a base of 7, and the other base is 4. Okay, so if I come up with its area then, it's going to be 1 half height b1 plus b2. So we get 3 over 2 times 11, so 33 over 2, or you could write 16.5. Okay. So again, you could, you could find the trap of the triangle and the square and add them together. It, you end up getting this exact same thing. All right, and then this one looks like one that maybe we wouldn't know how to do, right? It's actually very, very difficult to do with, with antiderivatives. We don't know how to do the antiderivative of the square root of 4 minus x squared. Okay, so if I was going to do it in the method of the next section, it would be kind of hard, okay? But we can do this with a geometric argument. We can think about what the function is. Okay, so we have y equals the square root of 4 minus x squared. All right, that's our function. And some of you might know right away what that looks like. Some of you may not have an idea, okay? And you can graph it on your graphing calculator if you get confused. But if you think about it, 
if I square both sides and then add the x squared over, this form might look a little bit more familiar. It's a circle. But in the original, we didn't have a plus or minus, right? We didn't have that. Okay, we only had a plus. Okay, so if you only have a plus, that means it's the top part of the circle. Okay. So my center of the circle is 0, 0, and my radius is 2. But I only have the top part of the circle. Okay, so I have a semicircle, which I can find the area of, right? The area of a semicircle is going to be 1 half pi r squared. So I have 1 half pi, and my radius was 2, so 2 squared. So my area ends up being 2 pi. Okay. So we can use geometric arguments in order to find definite integrals. We don't always have to um, do a midpoint rule or do the, uh, you know, the really long infinite sums. We don't have to do that. Okay, there's other ways to do this. Okay, so using this line of thought, if I have um, an integral from, z from, not zero, from a to a, okay, what that's saying is we have some kind of function, and we don't have any, like, width, right? We just have from a to a. Okay, there's no area there then. That area would end up being zero. Okay, but if we have something, you know, the area from A to B, then when I talk about the area from B to A, it actually ends up being a negative number. It's the opposite. Okay, and the reason that is is because now your width, instead of going from here to here, for a width of a rectangle, you're going backwards. The width is negative for the rectangle, which is kind of strange. Um, but basically, if you see something where it's it's wrong, where it's like 5 to 3, it should make you feel like uneasy. You should be like, ooh, 5 to 3. That's that's not the way we write that. We write the 3 on the bottom and the 5 on the top. So what we do is we change it to negative 3 to 5. Okay, so a negative out front, and then we do the integral from 3 to 5. All right, so it says if f is integrable on the three closed intervals, so A to B, and then also B to C. Oops, which we see. Okay, and we have the area from A to B, and then we have another area from B to C, right? It makes sense that if we add those two areas together, it's going to be the integral from A to C, right? You just add the two areas together. That's all we do. Okay, and the last one. Are pretty basic. If you think about your sigma rules, like with the infinite integrals, we could pull numbers out to the front. Same thing with integrals, because basically it is a sigma. Um, it means kind of the same thing. So we can pull a constant to the front. We can't pull out x's, but we can pull out constants. Numbers. All right, and then also with our sigmas, remember we could break apart the sigmas into two separate things. Well, same thing here. We can break apart the integrals into two separate integrals. So if we have from A to B and A to B, we can have you know, the two things added, or if there was a minus, then we can subtract as well. Okay? All right, so one last example here, one last bit. All right, so it says use a result from 2B on the last page to evaluate the integral from 3 to 0. So like I was saying, when you see like the big number on the bottom and the small number on top, that should make you uncomfortable. We don't write things that way. We always have to rewrite. So what we're going to do is we're going to change it to 0 to 3, but when we do that, we have to make it negative. Okay, so we're going to have x plus 4 dx. And we found on the other page, that was the trapezoid example. That's what this one was. Okay, and its answer was 33 over 2. So this answer is going to be negative 33 over 2. Okay, number two, we have the integral from pi to pi. So that should be, you know, making you think, oh, wait, we can't do that. That's going to be an area of zero. And then it says use a graph to help evaluate. So this is something we can, you know, sketch out and use common shapes from geometry to help us. So we're going from negative one to one. It's going to be the area under the curve, trapped by the x-axis in the curve, like that. So we have two triangles. And those triangles are going to be one half base, which is one, and height, which is one. 
Oops. So base times height. So when I add them together, I end up getting one. Okay, and then this one is kind of strange, but it's saying if I have one to three of all of that, so negative x squared plus 4x minus 3, then I can break apart the integral. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do 1 to 3 of negative x squared, and I need a dx whenever I have that integration sign. And I have 1 to 3 of 4x, and I have 1 to 3 of negative 3, like that. And then I continue pulling things to the front. I can pull constants to the front. So this is going to be negative 1 to 3 of x squared dx plus 4, 1 to 3 of x dx, plus negative 3, 1 to 3 of, it's like 1 dx, right? So we just write dx. And those are the things that I was given. I was given all, oops, one more, all of those things right here. Okay, so if, I find, if I'm finding that, um, the negative integral from 1 to 3 of x squared, this part was, 26 over 3, so I have negative 26 thirds plus 4. This part was 4. And I have negative 3 times 2. So I get negative 26 over 3 plus 16 minus 6, so I'm going to say plus 10. So 30 over 3 minus 26 over 3, so I get 4 over 3. Okay, so that's kind of a longer way of what we're going to do in the next section, but totally works. So you can break apart the integral just like you can break apart this big list that we did before. All right, and then you can also get information from graphs. So this is the very last problem. So it says the graphs of f of x and g of x are shown below. Use them to evaluate the following. So we just learned that we can break apart an integral. So we're going to do that because we have two separate graphs. We have the graph of f and we have the graph of g. We don't have the graph of f plus g. All right. So when I see the integral from 0 to 3 of f of x dx, here's my f function. Okay, 0 to 3 is going to be this area right here. Okay, and it's kind of hard to tell. I've now filled in all my points, but you guys can uh, definitely see it on your notes. What's my end point? Okay, this is 3, and this ends up being 5. So I'm going to have 1 half base times height. And then the other one is also a triangle. It's just a little bit taller. So its height is, I think, 8. Okay, so it's going to be 1 half base times height. So we get 15 over 2 plus, I'm going to leave it as over 2, so 24 over 2. So my answer then would be 39 over 2. Okay. All right, and the same thing with subtraction. So I can break it apart into 3 to 7, f of x dx minus 3 to 7, g of x dx, like that. So if I have f of x and I'm going from 3 to 7, 1, let's see, 4, 5, 6, 7, it does go to that highest point there. We have a trapezoid. Okay, and its trapezoid has a base of 4. This height was 5, and this height is 11. I shouldn't say base. Uh, it was uh, the height of 4, and then the two bases were 5 and 11. If I think about it on its side, sometimes you kind of have to draw it out on its side when you're first learning these, like that. Or you could break it apart into a triangle and a rectangle. So either way. So I get that. And then I have minus. The other one ends up being from 3 to 7, Oops, it's right there. Okay, so it's a rectangle. Okay, and that rectangle, going across this distance, it's 4, and up to the top, it's 8. So 4 times 8. So I have 1 half times 4 times 16, so 1 half of 16 is 8, 8 times 4 is 32, and I have minus 32. So this integral's answer is actually 0.
Okay, so what it means is that they actually had identical areas. So when we subtracted those areas, we were left with nothing. And you can kind of see that if you look at these little tiny triangles here and here. So if you see the integral for f of x from 3 to 7, that included this triangle, okay? But g of x included this triangle. Um, so that's why they ended up being exactly the same shape in the end, or the same area in the end, because they have those two identical triangles involved. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. Kind of ran through some geometric areas. Um, we did some midpoint rule. We did a lot of things in this section.